expert in autism, Doreen Grandpache. Dr. Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Ask Dr. Doreen, uh, and this is your talk. I'm going to let you talk. But yeah. can I just say first? <laughs> So terrible. Like you talk, and then I'm like, wait, can I just give? A sure. We are still going to give away another 10 yeah. Discovery Toys gift cards during this hour. If you're just tuning in, we love Discovery Toys. They were very generous with us. We're not going to be able to do this for every single podcast, but um, there will be sev several special ones. And for this is a special one. We're going to give away 10 because we want to start this out right. Uh, it's a $25 gift card that you can use on their USA Discovery uh, Toy website, mm -hmm. not on Amazon, not in the store, but on their website so amazing the toys yes. to choose from so how you will look at their lovely logo so how you will do this is throughout dr grampy shay's talk if you make a comment or ask a question then you will be entered we have people backstage who are uh sitting in the green room and writing down your names and putting them in a hat and then they pick the names out uh, and so we'll announce those at the end of the hour. Also, let you know that you can donate right now to uh, a fundraiser that we are doing, both Dr. Grampiche and I, <laughs> where if, I love how you giggle every time we bring I it up. It so I can't much. wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> Last night I was ordering all these things. I'm like, I'm going to do this. If I had known it would make you happy to shave my head, I would have offered I'm a long just, time ago. I've never but, shaved anyone's head, so oh this my, is going to be that's so, so funny, interesting. You officiate weddings and you save people lives That's right. and you do all these <laughs> wonderful things so now you're going to be able to add barber to it. your uh female barber to your list of things so what are we talking about uh we're raising money for autism care today for ipads for grants where people have asked for ipads to help an individual on the spectrum to be able to communicate because we feel like that's a really important thing. So we're trying to raise at least $5,000. Right. If we raise at least $5,000, then in the last hour of the podcast-a-thon, which will be Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time, Dr. Grampiche will buzz my head live you on the show. You do not want to miss that. And so there is the, the, the place where you need to go to donate. Any size amount of money, we'll, we'll take whatever you've got, couch cushion change, whatever it is. Give butter, B U T T E R dot com slash iPad challenge. If you will go there. Who came up with this name? I, I want to know. I'm pretty sure it was Sarah. But if you will go there, <laughs> if you will go there and donate, um, then we can get to that $5,000. i am sure it. we can raise five, at least $5,000, right? I certainly hope so. So uh, be writing in and, uh, and we'll get you entered. But I'm going to turn this over the fabulous Dr. Doreen Grampiche is here she's an expert in the field of autism has been working in this field for over 45 years and has thank you um, just been a godsend to so many of us myself oh, my at the pleasure. top of the list Honestly, right it's... uh but this is the important talk so thank you so much it's all yours and of course I can't do it unless Trevin puts up my powerpoint <laughs> <laughs> he will uh, he will so oh there we go so that's awesome so uh, thanks very much, everybody, and I'm going to try and go through and talk about anxiety in our kids and in ourselves because it's a topic that comes up over and over, and I'm so happy that it comes up because so many people talk to me about anxiety. In fact, the last hour we had a ton of questions on this subject. So we're going to explore anxiety in ourselves. What is anxiety? What are the signs of anxiety? How do I know if my child has anxiety? How do I treat anxiety in my child? And how do I treat anxiety in myself? Because I really do want to hit both how we experience it and how, how our kids do as well. OK, so, how, oh, there's little me. Yes, That's so that nice. fun? I love it. I love how Traven does that, too. He's amazing. So cool. How do we define anxiety? So this is something that was written by the Nas National Institutes of Mental Health, and they said, Anxiety is a normal reaction to stress. It helps us deal with a tense situation in the office, study harder for an exam, keep focused on an important speech. In general, it helps one cope. But when anxiety becomes excessive or an irrational dread of everyday situations, now it's something that is a disabling disorder. And this is important because when we, when we say anxiety, initially everybody thinks anxiety equals a bad thing. 
a certain level of anxiety is actually a good thing. If we didn't have any anxiety at all, none of us would ever get up or do anything or accomplish anything. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. The second thing is we all experience anxiety differently. When I'm nervous, I, and I actually got these answers from a class I was teaching one time, people threw them out. This is how people experience anxiety. I worry, I am afraid, I don't sleep, I don't eat, I eat too much, I obsess about things, I have racing thoughts, I have heart palpitations, I have irritable bowel syndrome, I feel dizzy. So people have different experiences of anxiety as well. And the way we manage anxiety is completely different as well. Here are again some things that some of my people in my class threw out. This is, I said, how do you manage it when you have anxiety? I distract myself. I keep myself busy. I talk to my friends to gain reassurance. I pray. I take medications that help me. I exercise. I breathe, meditate, and do yoga. I practice positive self-talk. I try to change my beliefs. I avoid what's making me anxious. I take drugs or alcohol or other addictive substances. I try to change what is causing me the anxiety, okay? So just keep, uh, you know, notice that there's a huge array of how people handle anxiety. And we're gonna talk about some of these because it's, they're important. Now, first I'm gonna put on my behaviorist hat and from a, as, as you guys all know, I've many times said from a behavioral psychology perspective, everything we do is to get something good or avoid something bad. Feeling anxious is generally something people don't like, right? So sometimes we will avoid situations that may bring on anxiety. A lot of people, and that's when we start to talk about social anxiety, that's one of those things is that you'll avoid social situations because when you go into that situation, you're experiencing anxiety. And of course, if we can't avoid the situation, if you're thrown into it, you'll do something to cope. Now, some of the things you do to cope are good, and some of the things that we do are not so good. Like, as I mentioned on the previous slide, for instance, people who might drink a lot. A lot of people drink excessively because they're anxious and they're trying to reduce their anxiety, right? So some of the coping mechanisms are not ideal, but they're all coping strategies. And when we do these coping strategies, what are we trying to gain? Well, we're trying to avoid or reduce the anxiety and we're finding other things that are rewarding or we're hoping to find other things so that they can replace the anxiety. Or we want to try to gain a better understanding of what's causing the anxiety or we want to change our perceptions and beliefs so we have less anxiety. This is why we do these various things because we're trying to get, wrap our, our arms around this and figure out how to cope with it, right? Okay. Now let's talk for a moment, and I want, this is kind of important because a lot of you as parents may actually uh, have experienced a lot of anxiety yourselves. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And those of you who are watching who have autism, I want you to just kind of sit back and, and, you know, later on maybe email me and, or text me and let me know if you think I'm right. Because when I try for many, many years, I tried to figure out, you know, how do we know if our kids, especially kids who can't communicate, how do we know that they have anxiety, right? And I started seeing it. And I always wondered, you know, what, would we always know? How would the anxiety show up in our kids? What ways do they have to cope? Because remember, we all have coping. Someone had said, I exercise. What a great way to cope. I do yoga, meditation. What about our kids? Do they have a way to cope? And how do they calm themselves? Can we help reduce what causes them anxiety to begin with? Or can we teach them coping mechanisms? Because, so if you think about our overall goal, uh, you know, I'm a clinician, but you as parents or you as individuals who on the spectrum are experiencing anxiety, your goal is basically to recognize anxiety in the individual, to help the person recognize 
what makes them anxious, like what is actually causing the anxiety, help them find good coping strategies, help them feel confident enough to approach situations that would normally cause them anxiety, help them overcome that anxiety, and then help them find ways to reward themselves for having accomplished that. By the way, are you amazed that I could read that? I, I was I, like I, having I a hard time. No, I was literally the sitting here going, so. boy, she's got much better <laughs> eyesight than I do. Yeah. So we're basically trying to help folks understand what is causing the anxiety and to find a way to overcome it or cope with it. Okay, so definition time. From a very, uh, you know, technical, clinical way, the Diagnostic Manual 5, which is called the DSM-5, um, has a whole chapter on anxiety. It's a huge section on anxiety. And the, all of these things that you see on the screen are, part, are listed under anxiety. So I'll just list them for those of, uh, folks who are just on the verbal, on the audio podcast. Yeah. So we have separation anxiety disorder, selective mutism. Selective mutism is when the individual doesn't talk, doesn't respond, does not vocalize. Specific phobias, any kind of phobia or fear. Social anxiety disorder, which we will talk about. Panic disorder. Agoraphobia, those are individuals who will just not come out of their house anymore because they're so afraid. Generalized anxiety disorder, which is having anxiety in more, to, towards one or more stimuli. It's generalized to multiple situations. Substance or medication induced. There are medications. For instance, if someone who does not have ADHD takes medications for ADHD stimulant drugs will cause you to feel anxious. So there are medications or substances that will heighten your anxiety experience. Anxiety disorder due to other medical condition. A lot of people who have heart problems will feel a flutter and that can cause anxiety. If you have just any other kind of pain that suddenly occurs, it can cause anxiety. Other specified anxiety disorder and unspecified uh, anxiety disorder. In other words, there are, there's so much anxiety occurring that sometimes it's none of these and we still can't figure out exactly what's causing the individual to suffer. The specific definition in the diagnostic manual says that anxiety is excessive worry and apprehensive expectations occurring more days than not for at least six months about a number of events or activities and you have to have three or more of the following symptoms to, to get the diagnosis. So it has to be occurring more often than not, right? So let's say, you know, four days of the week, and it has to ha be going on for at least six months, and you should be seeing three of the following things. Restlessness, so that's one that you see, like people who's, who are very, very restless. Easily fatigued. Of course, anxiety is very taxing on the body, so someone with a lot of heightened anxiety will actually be exhausted. Difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and last but not least, sleep disturbance. Those are the main uh, features, and if you have three of those, and they've been ongoing for six months, then you will get a diagnosis in the anxiety area. Okay. Isn't this almost all of us now since really the pandemic? Is. It really is. There's so much of that going on that it could, I mean, there's so much increased anxiety after the pandemic. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So let's go back for a minute. And, and again, I wanted to, I don't know. Oh, yeah, good. I can go back. So just so as you're reading this and some of you will be thinking about yourselves and some of you might be thinking about your children. I'm going to try to tie it to both sides because, you know, I had two different talks, Shannon. One was just for parents and one was for individuals. And I felt like it's so common now that I can try to tie it in for, for both. Okay, so if you, and, and this is really important now. As I loved Kobe's comments in the last, in two hours ago because he was talking about some of this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when someone has autism, what, ask yourself, 
why would someone with autism have anxiety? And there's so many reasons, and I just tried to list some of them here. For example, uh, you are having a hard time understanding everything that's going on around you. That in itself is anxiety provoking because you feel lost, you feel like you're falling behind, you don't know what people are talking about. It's, you know, you're not able to attend to important things. For example, you might be distracted and a sound that triggers everyone else, you might be like, oh my God, why is everybody running now? What's going on? And that can lead to anxiety, not being on track with important things that are happening in your environment. Black and white thinking. Now this is super important. It's gonna come up in like 10 slides in a minute. Whenever, and this is important for both adults and children, whenever you have black or white thinking, you will tend to have more anxiety. And that's because you will tend to do this thing that's called a cognitive distortion. And it'll come up and there's a lot of cognitive distortions and I'll talk about them because one of the treatments for anxiety, the most effective treatment, is to recognize when your brain is playing tricks on you. And as you know, a lot of our kids have black or white thinking. They have a very hard time thinking th things like kind of in the gray. It could be this, it could also be this. They are very rule governed, right? And that causes anxiety. Fear of failure. Obviously, any of us who are afraid, and Kobe was talking about this earlier, yes. and he was saying, I was so nervous of like acting or giving a speech, and it was just causing so much anxiety. Feeling like they don't fit in, not knowing how to handle situations, not understanding what is expected of them, hyper reactive to environmental sounds and lights. All of these things could be causing anxiety. There's more. If, what about the underlying stuff that a lot of people with, with autism actually experience? For example, not getting enough sleep. Any of you, if you don't, and this is like one of the things I'm worried about for you in this 44 <laughs> hours, and you said, oh no, I'll get giddy and silly. Yes. I'm like, well, when I don't sleep, my anxiety levels go high because I'm just oh. like so jittery. Yeah. So not getting enough sleep, not feeling well due to an underlying gastrointestinal issue. You guys, I don't know, you know, if you've ever had, if you've ever gone to a restaurant, had something to eat and your stomach's like, oh my God, it's hurting. The number one emotion that people associate that with or label that feeling is anxiety. Mm -hmm. People always say, God, I feel so anxious because I don't know when I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So a lot of our kids have ongoing gastrointestinal distress and that could be causing it as well. How about sensory overload? The number one thing, sensory overload. I often give the example that when I went to give a talk in Hong Kong, I was so incredibly, first of all, it was almost all of these. I had not slept, I was jet lagged. Um, I didn't really know where I am. I couldn't understand what's going on around me because nothing is in, Engl in English letters, in Latin letters. You can't read, nobody speaks English. Like you, they give you at the hotel a card so that in case you get lost, you can give that card to the taxi driver, mm. right? Because you don't know how to tell them where to go. Yeah. So it's, and, and there's neon lights everywhere, noise, smells, everything is foreign, right? So sensory overload will cause anxiety in everyone. That's just the given. Being on medications that can agitate or cause a sensation of anxiety. A lot of our kids are on stimulants for, for ADHD. They could be experiencing anxiety as well. Receiving treatments then can increase. Imagine uh, there was a, when I wrote this slide years ago, of course it was very, and still a lot of people are doing methyl B12 shots. Or if, let's say if your child is very anxious about a procedure like get, receiving an injection or any other thing that they're going through, let's say they have allergies, whatever that might be that the treatment for that other comorbid illness could be causing anxiety. Imbalances in neurotransmitters. And this is really important because anxiety is very, very strongly correlated with an imbalance of serotonin, the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is why a lot of the medications for anxiety are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They help us absorb our own serotonin better. And that is something that's very important because you know, all the way back to the 
I guess, late 70s, early 80s, when I was doing research on cause of autism, mm -hmm. w all we knew back then was, oh, it's very associated with serotonin. There's a lot of articles that say it's too much serotonin, too little serotonin. It's just we know that it's highly associated with, now we know not just serotonin, but also norepinephrine and dopamine. And then, of course, abnormal activity levels in certain parts of the brain. So these are all things that our kids, you know, like children who have seizures, for instance, have very heightened anxiety when a seizure is about to occur as well. So there's all of these things make it very clear that the likelihood to, to, that a child with the, that someone on the spectrum will experience anxiety is high, it is higher than the typical uh, population. How do we see anxiety in individuals who have ASD? Possible ways. We could see lots of different things, but you know, here are some things. How about the obsessive compulsive ritualistic behavior? It's one of the symptoms of autism, right? Ritualistic behavior. But, and wh how, what if that's anxiety? I often, when someone says to me, what do you think about the stereotypes? I say, well, I think it's either sensory pain or anxiety. And a lot of times you can see like when there's obsessive compulsive behavior, like lining up objects, that is, in fact, by the way, I don't know if folks know this, but until this very last uh, diagnostic manual, OCD, obsessive compulsive, was one of the anxiety disorders. Mm. Now OCD became so big that they gave it its own chapter. <laughs> but it has a huge overlap. It has a 76% overlap. Wow. But if you have anxiety, you're going to have, 76% of the time, you're going to also have obsessive compulsive behaviors. Like, you know, people like washing their hands repetitively yeah. or doing a routine repetitively. And in our kids, you see that as things like lining up objects or hoarding. Hoarding is anxiety. It's an anxiety disorder, right? You, it gives you a sense of safety. Uh, body rocking is another interesting one. I don't know if I've told you this, but when you rock, one of the things that you're doing f forward and backwards is you are activating the parasympathetic activity of the brain, and that is calming. So body rocking is actually something that is a way to calm ourselves. And that's why we have rocking chairs, by the way. You know, So that's kind of an interesting thing. What about uh, the other things that our kids exhibit that could be anxiety? For instance, they don't sleep. Right? What if our kids are not sleeping partially because of that? What about irritable bowel or GI issues? Now I'm saying the GI issues could be causing the anxiety. Remember, that it goes both ways, right? Yeah. The anxiety can also be causing GI issues. Yeah. When you have anxiety, your digestion speeds up and you can easily be experiencing a lot of anxiety or irritable bowel or a lot of um, GI issues just because you're anxious. Hives. Hives is a very, very clear uh, sign of anxiety. What about the avoidant behaviors, like for instance, self-isolation or not giving eye contact? I mean, uh, you know, anyone who has ever had a fear of social public speaking knows that the first thing they, they have a hard time with is giving eye contact. Eye contact increases anxiety. It's more intrusive. Social avoidance. And the self-stimulatory behaviors that we do, when have you, I don't know if you've, you know, people who have anxiety will always be fidgeting with an object or something like that. Now, only in children with autism do we call it self-stimulatory, but it is self-stimulatory. Yeah. So these are all signs that an individual with autism could be experiencing anxiety. Research shows that studies say that individuals with ASD experience greater levels of anxiety than all community populations, doesn't matter the age. In fact, individuals with ASD show greater levels of anxiety than individuals within other clinical groups, in other words, within developmental disabilities, ADHD, or any other kind of, now it's called intellectual disability. So all other diagnoses, ASD folks still experience more anxiety. In fact, people with ASD show similar levels of anxiety 
only to when they're compared with people who have an actual diagnosis of anxiety. Wow. In other words, it's a huge overlap and it is one, it's the only diagnosis where the level of anxiety that we see in individuals who are diagnosed with it is just as high as people who have a pure diagnosis of like generalized anxiety. Wow. So it's very common. Now, why is it hard to diagnose anxiety in individuals with autism? Well, we have this thing called diagnostic overshadowing where something that is so big as autism, we attribute everything to that, right? We ignore things like, you know, I, I've told you the story where um, a lot of times like someone will come and tell me, oh, but they told me that's just the autism. Right. And I'm like, mm, no, it's not just the autism. It's something else that we need to deal with, right? Sometimes the reason it's overshadowed is because it's misunderstood as a behavior problem. So many times, and this is what I think people refer to now as progressive ABA or like you're, you're more aware in ABA, yeah. is when you actually pay attention to what the child is going through or what the individual is going through. You know, if someone has extreme social anxiety, if someone has hypersensitivity to sounds and sights and stimuli, and that causes them extreme anxiety, do I really want to flood them by throwing them into a social situation? Or do I need to be a little bit more like cautious around it? What is causing it? Um, and of course, the symptoms get mixed up. Like is someone avoiding the situation because he has autism? Or is it anxiety, right? Because of course with autism, everybody says you isolate, self-isolate. The question you have to ask is, why? Why do you self-isolate? And I believe it's always because of anxiety. So there are a couple of assessment tools, the anxiety rating scales. This is called, it's a stress survey and it's a, a form that you fill out and it's okay. It can help identify the autism comorbidity interview, a semi-structured interview is a little bit better because it will identify things other than just anxiety. But I think the way that you want to look for anxiety in an individual is all those other things that I had said before, is look for the symptoms. If you see the symptoms, then assume that there could be anxiety. And how, now let's talk about how you're going to help the individual cope with or overcome those fears. And of course, as a behaviorist, again, I have to say direct observation is the best way. As behaviorists, generally you wanna do what's called a functional behavior assessment, and it's looking at things that happen before and after a behavior. This is kind of an example of what I was talking about earlier. From behavioral perspective, someone will say, you know, it's time for school, and Joe will have a tantrum. And then, of course, as soon as he is in school, they'll send him home because he had a tantrum. And the behaviorist might say, is he having a tantrum because he's trying to avoid school? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to make sure that he can identify and tell me in a better way how to, he wants to avoid school, but I also have to teach him not to avoid school. Right. And another way to look at it, Shannon, is to say, he must have so much anxiety about going to school. How do I help his anxiety? How do I help him vocalize that he's feeling anxious? And how do I help him develop coping strategies to get over that. So, treatments for anxiety, the, you know, we have to touch this subject. The number one, there's two basic treatments. One is cognitive behavioral and behavioral, and on the other side are medications, psychopharmacology. And there are a lot of medications that are just for anxiety, and as, as I said earlier, all of these medications influence the neurotransmitters and control our ability to feel anxious. Um, and these are not, I mean, when you look at the top, we're talking selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These are not medications that usually have any kind, they don't change your pers personality at all. They just basically take the edge off a little bit and make it, a little bit less uh, likely that a certain situation or stimulus will irritate you or cause you anxiety. So they are, they are, I'm very supportive of these medications and I will tell you that I think in the US there's easily close to 70% of people across the board, not just, not on the spectrum, but across the board 
who take one form of or other of medication for anxiety. By the way, the medications for anxiety and depression are the same because anxiety is essentially the same as depression. Depression is when anxiety has not been dealt with for a long time. There are also, of course, treatments that are medications that in, it can help with the stuff that's underlying. So remember we said, let's say if you have gastrointestinal issues, you, that can lead to anxiety. Okay, let's take some medications so you don't have GI problems. And then let's take some medications that help sleep. And all of those, if you can get rid of those medical issues that are underlying the anxiety or causing the anxiety, then obviously you're also going to help the anxiety. So that's something to consider as well. Then in terms of a behavioral perspective, this is systematic desensitization. This is the primary pure behavioral way, and it's not even pure, it's very cognitive behavioral, way of handling anxiety. And it starts with, you, you, it basically has three components. The first component is that you want to develop a hierarchy of anxiety provoking images or experiences. It, it, it could be video, it could be real experiences. You basically, let's say someone is, has, a so, social, has a specific phobia of dogs, right? And every time they want to go out of the house, they are going to be terrified and have massive anxiety meltdown because there are dogs everywhere. So what do we do? We produce a hierarchy. So we produce 20 pictures and the, the first picture might be, uh, or you know, 10 pictures. And the first picture might be a, a scene of their, their school or something, but there's a tiny dog somewhere in the background of the picture. The next one will be, you know, a, a scene they're familiar with, but a dog is closer in the picture. Uh, so on and so forth. By the time you get to picture 10, we're looking at a dog with teeth, like with their face up front in the picture. So you've increased. Now, after 10, you might go to a video of a dog. And so you make it as real life as you can from zero to 20 or however, whatever you want. And you now, so that's your first thing that you do. The second thing is, you will now teach the individual some form of relaxation, breathing exercise, or imagery. And that means you will teach them to relax, close their eyes, do breathing. We've done this with lots and lots of kids, just counting. Counting and breathing helps a lot. Just one, like that, two. And you will teach them. You can also even teach the child to visualize something very pleasant, right? You can help them by giving them material, like visualize your favorite scene in a movie or visualize a beautiful place that you like, that kind of thing. Now, the third step is that you pair these two. So first you start with picture number one, that's not even that anxiety provoking, and you have the child sit and visualize until they're totally comfortable with it. And then you go to picture number two, and you do this gradually, you will eventually, of course, get to a point where the child's showing signs of anxiety. And that's where you stay for a while. And you will do meditation, breathing, uh, until your child feels more comfortable with this. And then now you're ready to, to move up. And this, this whole thing, systematic desensitization, is used in general for phobias and generalized anxiety and so on. And it is very, very effective. The last step, of course, is to go in vivo, which means you go outside and, and there's a small, um, a small dog on a leash. Again, you want to make it very gradual exposure. And, and don't forget, in addition to the meditation and breathing, you always want to reward your child for every step that they conclude and that they succeed at. So this is kind of the behavioral way of managing um, anxiety when it's, when it's a little bit too difficult for the child to understand or become aware of their own thoughts. And sometimes our kids are too young or they're just not at the point where they have the cognitive awareness. And this is a very, this paired with medication is a very, very effective way of helping the child. Now we want to go back for a minute and talk about how anxiety affects ourselves. Well, if you're a parent, let me tell you, your anxiety will affect your child tremendously. There is no question about it. No matter how much you try to hide it, 
Um, and I can tell you this with just me and my typically developing kids. Like they always knew when I was anxious because I was trying to do things fast. I was getting upset that things were not happening. Kids know. So we need to also make sure that we, it's, I think you gave me the example of the oxygen mask or oh, someone, yeah. you know, when, yeah. when you're on a plane and the oxygen mask drops, you're supposed to put it on yourself first before you help your child. So let's talk about some things that will help you and, and also uh, people who are on this, on this uh, spectrum but have cognitive awareness and can analyze their thoughts because we're going to really get into that in a minute. Okay, so this is the whole area called cognitive behavior therapy, my favorite. I love CBT more than I love ABA. I love cognitive behavior therapy. But as I said, it is a little bit harder because it has to do with mental and cognition. But the concept with cognitive behavior therapy is, and, and anxiety is that our thoughts result in our emotions, right? Everything we think produces a feeling. If you can learn to control your thoughts, then you can control your emotions. There's no question about it. Problem is, a lot of the time, we can't control our thoughts. It's just too hard. We have to get good at that. When you feel anxiety, cognitive behavior therapy tells you to break it down, break down your whole belief system, and evaluate what thought triggered that anxiety. What was it that you were thinking that made you feel anxious? Where did it come from? And is it actually helpful to you? For example, Kobe was saying he had social anxiety. Yeah. And so the next question for him from a CBT therapist would be, what about the social experience? When you think of a social experience, what about it causes you anxiety? For instance, he might say, I feel like I'm going to fail in a social experience or whatever it is you have to identify that thing that stimulus that's making you feel anxious and now we're going to talk about changing that thought pattern and changing those stories that we tell ourselves and see if it's going to change the resulting fear and anxiety there are these things called cognitive distortions this is where like every time i go through this lecture it's such a good reminder for myself even. So remember earlier when I was talking about all or nothing thinking? Well, here, here we go. This is when we perceive things as extremes, right? This distortion, this is just a th distortion is just some, a, a, a bad way of thinking. We think this way, it leads to the belief that things are either all good or all bad, and that there's no middle ground. So for example, I didn't have a clever response when she said hi to me, so I am a complete failure. And that's it. You, are, you destroy yourself because of one failure, right? I'm afraid of failing because that one time that I said something wrong means that I'm, I'm just not worthy. I'm a complete. So we, com we all or none, right? Whereas in reality, if you could reframe that thought and say, it doesn't really matter that I didn't have one clever reply, that doesn't mean I'm a complete failure. Everybody has heart, you know, like, it, not a big deal, not a big deal. So again, this is the beginning of, I, wa I want you guys to just pay attention to the different little tricks. These distortions are little tricks that our mind plays. And you have, and right now I'm just asking you to be aware of them, right? All or nothing thinking. Be aware of them, that you do that. And when you do that, try to look at it from a different perspective. Try to write the opposite. I'm not a complete failure. And, and we're going to also talk about other things you can do with these distortions. Here's another one, catastrophizing. <laughs> this is when we think a disastrous thing will happen after a relatively small occurrence, right? Uh, earlier today, I was hanging this giant <laughs> picture here, and I think I dropped something like a, a nail or something, and both I and Sarah, who's how we both were like, <gasps> something <laughs> like that, and we're like, don't fall, don't break. That's catastrophizing. Yeah, it's right. like a small thing that happens, and we're like, oh my God, a catastrophe is about to happen, yeah. right? It's the same, uh, you know, and uh, what I wrote is catastrophes actually very, very rarely happen in reality. They happen a lot more frequently in our thoughts, right? So being able to recognize our belief patterns when they describe an imaginary catastrophe can be very helpful 
in reducing anxiety. When I, after every time I give this lecture, for the next 24 hours, I'm recognizing the cognitive distortions in myself <laughs> continuously. So I hope you will do the same. Emotional reasoning is an interesting one. This is when you accept your emotional response as proof that, uh, of something bad having happened. So for example, uh, you feel bad, right? You're feeling horrible and you, you say to yourself, it must be something about this place is causing me anxiety. And it's not even anxiety, it's nothing at all, but just because you feel bad and anxiety is a feeling you're familiar with, you kind of pair them together. And we do that a lot. Fortune telling, of course. Fortune telling is when we make dramatic predictions about the future with very little or no evidence, right? For example, uh, earlier Parker had written, I'm, af I'm afraid that somebody might take advantage of me. Yeah. You're fortune telling, right? You're predicting something in the future and it's not based on reality. Maybe something, one thing may have happened that makes you feel that way, but now you're thinking all or none, right? It's not just because it happened one time, it doesn't mean it's gonna keep happening. Mind reading, that's another one where, you know, earlier I think, uh, was it Joe or Holly was, I think Joe was talking about how when you go to supermarkets and oh yes, the parents, you know, the experience of the parents with, uh, of the child with autism, I mean, this is such a, this is gonna put it, like you guys are gonna completely feel this one, right? When your child is young and they want everything or they just don't want the sound and sights in a supermarket and they don't want to be there. And so every time you go to a supermarket, it's a terrible experience and like over and over that happens. The first thing you're thinking, mind reading, everyone here probably thinks I'm an evil mom. It's funny because one time I was in a supermarket and a mom was having, uh, her child was having a meltdown yeah. and she was in line behind me and um, she turned to me and she was like, I'm so sorry, I, you know, I, I can't imagine what you think. And she was about to say, my child has autism. Yeah. And I said, no, 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 don't think that I'm judging you at all. I'm thinking of ways I could possibly help you. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. it's, and truthfully, that's mind reading because we, we have had a bad experience. We think other people are judging us in a bad way. Yes. Other people are looking at us and thinking you failed, thinking you don't know how to socialize, thinking you're a bad parent, thinking this is mind reading. And it happens, it, it, it's together with that all or none thinking because you might have five bad experiences at the supermarket doesn't mean that it's gonna be for the rest of your life. Right. Overgeneralization, that's again one of those things. It broad conclusions based on very small scenarios, right? It happens one time, doesn't mean that every trip is gonna be a failure. Labeling, labeling of course is best known, it's a cognitive distortion for all folks who are uh, in some way racist or, you know, so they label a whole genre of people yeah. based on the color of their skin or based on their culture or based on their religion. That is called labeling and it's a cognitive distortion because what you're saying is every one of this population will do the same exact thing. It's a distortion, it's a thought that is not based on reality. Magnifying the negative and minimizing the positive, two sides of the same coin, self-descriptive, right? We tend to always minimize positive situations and we, I like for instance, remember when I had four days of no electricity there? Oh yeah. I, I could have, and I was like, oh my God, or everything in the fridge has gone bad, blah, blah, blah. But I could have also just said, you know, the great thing is one of our sockets has a little bit of electricity, so I can actually charge my yeah. phone. So there's always a positive side that we don't see or talk about. We see negative, we tend to, human beings, tend to see negative stuff more. So with cognitive behavior therapy, all you're supposed to do is recognize your pattern. If you recognize the pattern, it becomes really easy to reframe it and to say, wait a minute, this is not reality. This is just a imaginary fiction in my head. How can I reframe it? How can I think of myself as a success, not a failure? How can I think that people are not judging my kid right now or, my, or me? How can I reframe these things? But the key is recognizing 
the kind of false belief, the kind of cognitive distortion. So I said false belief, Shannon, because when you look at cognitive distortions as false beliefs, yes. you realize how hard our kids have it because our kids struggle with false beliefs. Yes. Theory of mind yes. it helps them learn about these distortions, like that people think different things, right? And I want to reiterate that you said when you started talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, you were talking about with kids who are at a certain level of understanding and for the parents. Correct. This isn't necessarily going to be what's right for everyone, but very effective for people who can reason through. The that's behavior. right. That's right. And when it's for children who are not quite cognitively aware, that's where I was talking about the systematic desensitization process, which really works yes. with everyone, yeah. and also uh, psychopharmacology and medication, and I guess environmental change in general. If you know that your child has anxiety whenever they go to a certain situation, give them tools, right? Help them with, let's say, uh, prepare them better, uh, give them, a lot of times when kids have sensory issues, I say help them with giving them noise canceling headphones, giving them an area where they can calm down, all of those types of things. Yeah. And here's some modifications for individuals on the, on the spectrum, right? So use many visual stimuli to help identify and reframe. So for example, uh, toolbox, like for instance, you can tell the child, oh, we're going to go to a party right now. It's going to be noisy. Let's see what's in our toolbox. And then you open it, and in there is a headphone, and there's like, uh, you know, a book, uh, their favorite book, or things that they might have in there, or just books or pictures that might help them stay calmer. Um, written schedules. Written schedules in general will reduce anxiety, because a lot of anxiety has to do with not knowing what's coming, right? That's why we always do schedules for the child. You don't want to ever pick up a child and immediately just go run out with them. You want to make sure they have a schedule of what's happening to them in their day, written or visual, visual of any type. Narratives. Narratives are, um, uh, what, what do they call them? Story? Uh, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> social stories. Social stories. Social stories are narratives, right? You give the child a narrative, like, I am the boss. Anxiety is not the boss. And you would not believe how effective it is to, to draw a character and call it anxiety, and this is your character, and you're like, you know, having a sword fight or something, and you win, or something like that. So, or you even go up and you can hug the anxiety, and now the anxiety turns into happiness, or something like that. Visuals, stories, as I said, role play. Role playing is really effective for our kids because all you have to do is you sit with them and you can show them how they can go into situations that are fear evoking and you can uh, practice it with them obviously. Choice lists, the same thing. Here are some choices. Remember I said whenever your thinking is black and white, you tend to have more anxiety. So if you go into a situation and a child says, or uh, you, know, you can see that your child is, let's say, social anxiety, which is the most common, then you can write out and you can say, okay, so here, what are the things that are making you afraid? Like, you know, mom won't be there, or I will fail in front of other people, or whatever. And then you can write another list for them, which is, I'm going to shine, I'm going to have lots of friends, I'm going to play with this toy give them visual options that they can also consider as the outcome of an anxiety provoking situation. Drawings, thought bubbles, this is if your child is able or kind of on the verge of being able to think of emotions, that's why I loved that movie, uh, Inside, Inside Out. Out. Inside Out it was fantastic, you yeah. know, where you could actually see emotions yeah. as thought bubbles or as, you know, feeling characters. bubbles, characters. And that's, that is so helpful for a child to realize all of these things are inside them and they can choose which one comes out, right? And that is giving the child strength. Visual worksheets, there's lots of worksheets on, on how to handle fear evoking situations. Rules lists of how to cope. This is the kind of stuff I was telling you earlier about practice, right? So write down, if I feel like scared, I will go outside for a few minutes and take a deep breath. If I feel, uh, you know, lost, I will put my hand in my pocket and there I have my fidget toy where I can play. Lots of different techniques that you can use. Rules lifts of what's normal and what is excessive, because a lot of times 
fear and anxiety only occurs when, when our thoughts go out of control. I want to talk real quickly, and I know we only have like seven or eight minutes left, but yeah. I want to talk real quickly about ACT. ACT is a form of therapy that is used a lot with, has, has been shown to be very beneficial for parents. And basically it has to do with acceptance and mindfulness. In fact, let me show you this uh, uh, other slide. When we have issues, when we are focused on those cognitive distortions, it's because a distortion occurs in our head and then we fuse with it. We kind of like go with it and, our, and we obsess and our thoughts are just so involved and engaged that we can't disassociate and realize for a minute this is just a, a false belief, it's not real. ACT tells you all you need to do is to really just be aware of your thoughts. And actually if you look at the six steps that are involved in ACT therapy, I love them, the first one is cognitive diffusion, right? Which is you learn how to observe your thoughts in images or emotions and memories. Just observe them. Don't relive them. Observe them. Be aware of them. Accept them. And this is very interesting because in therapy we have found that if you fight a thought, it tends to recur. If you just think of a thought as a fleeting experience, this is an experience that's entering my body, it's exiting my body. It's there. Just every minute you have a different thought. And imagine it that way. Look at it as the waves that come and go. Snowflakes that fall. Something that passes. Allow yourself to just be with it. Okay? And then if you're really starting to feel anxious, start having contact with the present moment. The way you do that is senses. Sense the things that are around you. Think for a moment what my hands are feeling. What am I breathing? How's my breathing? Uh, what's, how do my feet feel in my shoes? How, do my, how does my back? So go through your body that way. Go into your senses and it'll bring you into the present time, which is often very, very helpful in getting you out of your head. Uh, observe yourself, see? Access a transcendental sense of self, um, of consciousness. This is mindfulness therapy talks about. If you can just like kind of one by one go through your entire, uh, how your body feels, what your senses are, you will be feeling more than thinking. And that will get you out of those run-on thoughts that are false beliefs. And then identify, and this is very important for parents because this I've seen over and over again, Discover something that is super important to you, to yourself. And a lot of times the values here are, I just want my child to be happy. I want me to be happy. It's not, and you come to realize that all those other thoughts, all those other things are not important. They're not, it's not important if you go in and someone is looking at you at a, at a, in a supermarket. It's just not vital to your life. And then you take an action that is a commitment to something. For instance, I know a lot of parents who feel successful, it's because they've committed to some intervention, they've committed to some routine, they've committed to learning some task that gets them closer and closer to their values. Uh, a lot of parents, of course, are, you know, like Shannon, for instance, is completely committed to spreading the news and getting information out there. So, you know, with that, you, your whole life changes and your anxiety levels definitely go down. And I think that should be it. My so goodness. We have, I didn't a, think we have like make you. three or four minutes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well but we have to say who the winners are. Okay. And there were so many questions that came in, too, that I don't think we're going we're gonna to get to all of them. But um, I, I'm happy to also talk more about everything I mentioned and answer questions. Uh, tomorrow when I do more Ask Dr. Doreen. There we go, and we can try to bank those. Um, but I want to take a second to say that we have uh, our 10 winners of the $25 um, Discovery Toys gift card. Uh, so what you'll need to do is email me. My email is shannon at autism-live.com, and I will put that into the chat in just a second. Um, but let me say that our winners, and remember, you can use these on the Discovery Toys website that is the U.S. website. They won't, they aren't for uh, use in stores or on other people's websites or internationally 
or um, on Amazon. So do have to give that disclaimer. But congratulations, Amy Scott, you have won a gift card. Amanda Bright, you won a gift card. Angie Suarez Munez, sorry for slaughtering your middle name. Susie Bay, uh, Robbie Moyo, Alicia Romero, Carrie Mallory Thompson, Pamela Elmore, Joe Honey, uh, you won, and so did Dahlia. So my, my email is on the screen there. It's shannon at autism-live.com. If you will email me now or in the next couple of days, I will get those to you. Give me a couple of days. Um, it's probably going to be Monday before I send those out, but you guys have won. Congratulations. Now you can go do some shopping for $25 uh, with Discovery Toys, who we absolutely love. We have got to take a break now. Was yeah. there something you wanted to add? I with? did. I just, well, first of all, I do want to say that the newer noise canceling headphones have a switch on them that you can have background noise enter. Oh. Just it's muffled, it's not huge. So you have on or off, so it completely blocks everything, or you can hear conversations, but not a lot of noise. There you so go. So they're fabulous for our kids. And I will talk much more about it, a lot of these things that came up. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, Shannon, because I'm about to leave for today, yeah. um, it, are my dear, dear friend Stephen Shore is next with you, I believe. Yes. And I am so sorry that I cannot stay. I love Stephen. He, we know each other for a long time, and we actually were on the Autism Society of America uh, Central Board together for several years, and I have missed him. And I will definitely look back on this show and see how he's been doing. Amazing. And please give him my best. I will. I absolutely will. Which uh, teases for us, our next show is going to be Autism Live, and our special guest will be Dr. Stephen Shore. Remember that the hour after that, we're going to be joined by Temple Grandin, also live. Um, Stephen this hour, and then Dr. Grandin the hour after. We're going to take a short break, because uh, Mama does need to use the restroom. Yes. So, and then we will be back with Autism Live, and we will see Dr. Grampiche tomorrow. 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Uh, and, and you've got an amazing show then. In, in fact, you're going to be here for, I think, three so, hours in a hours. row. Yep. So that'll be great. And then more in the afternoon tomorrow. So yes. it, the pad, podcast-a-thon just parades on, you guys. Stick with us, and we're going to be back in just a couple. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Doreen live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.